So I want to continue my discussion of a, uh, quantum field theories with a global symmetry. So quant we assume that there is a quantum field theory with a global symmetry, conserved global symmetry, current J mu, which classically obeys the equation d mu j mu equals zero, which in momentum space reads p plus j, j minus plus p minus j plus equals zero. That's the classical conservation equation, which upon quantization should be interpreted as an operator equation. So let me write it in words. So it would be interpreted as an operator equation, which means that we're not allowed to impose it at coincident points, but we have to let the theory determine whether it should or should not be imposed at coincident points. So should not, should only hold at separated points. Separa separated points. Now, if you have some physical model where it turns out that you can also impose it at coincident points, great. Then the symmetry would be what we call non-anomalous, but in general, it's not possible. So this is a well-defined, so the problem of determining the correlation functions. Under the assumption that this equation holds at separated points is a completely well-defined mathematical problem, okay? And the general solution to this problem is that J plus, J plus, I'm going to write it down again because we will now derive some very interesting consequences of these uh, three equations. So uh, the well-defined mathematical problem is that I want to impose a conservation equation at separated points. So the solution to this problem is that this is p plus squared over p squared times some general undetermined function plus some constant. Uh, here you would get some the same function up to some constant. And here you get Again, the same function up to some yet another constant. Okay? If you were to impose the conservation equation also at coincident points, you would have to conclude that k left equals k equals k right, which would be fine. This would not lead to mathematical inconsistencies, but it would not describe some very interesting physical systems. It would just describe a subset of the possible physical systems. Now, <clears throat> uh, let's see what happens with the conservation equation at uh, coincident points. So, let's try to study the correlation function of p plus j minus plus p minus j plus, this is at momentum p, <clears throat> and let's say j plus at momentum minus p. Okay, so this is just a simple algebra, uh, hitting it with this p pluses and p minuses. Here I forgot the minus sign, and I'll put a minus sign here too. So it's a very simple exercise that you're, you're encouraged to do. By the way, uh, I uploaded some notes. <clears throat> lecture notes which are very, very long and they contain much more than I'm saying here. But they also contain lots of exercises. So you could try to do some of these exercises. Okay, so this uh, exercise would lead to the cancellation of this. The A would cancel out because if A did not cancel out, that because it's a, not, it's a non polynomial, that would lead to a violation at separated points. But K doesn't cancel out and we get K left minus K, maybe up to a sign. Uh, times p plus, okay? That's just a simple exercise. Similarly, we can take the same operator and hit it with j minus at minus p. And then we would get up to some sign that I can't track now. We get k right minus k times pi mi p minus, okay? So now you see when can we impose the conservation equation at coincident points. This is a polynomial in momentum. So that's good. That means that we've satisfied the rules of quantum field theory, which is that we are supposed to impose this equation only at separated points. This is a, a pure contact term, which looks like d plus of a delta function. And this is d minus of a delta function. So the conservation equation is only violated 
at coincident points. It's, well, it's respected at separated points. So you see that there are two interesting situations. If it so happens that k left is equal to k right, if it so happens, it's true in some physical models, then we can choose this k to be equal to both of them. And then the conservation equation is satisfied not only at separated points, but also at coincident points. You should notice uh, first that this coefficient k is just a polynomial. So it has no impact on current correlation functions at separated points. While k left and k right have an impact. I mean, they determine the correlation functions at separated points, as you'll see in a second. But if uh, k left and k right are not the same, then necessarily at least one of those equations would not be possible to put to zero. And therefore, uh, d mu, j mu suffers from so J mu is a good global symmetry, but it has an anomaly. And if we tried, let's say that if we try to gauge, so if we try to gauge this uh, symmetry, we would get into a contradiction because this is given by F rho sigma, epsilon rho sigma times K left minus K right. So if we were to try to gauge the symmetry, meaning to couple it to a background field, we would get some non-zero answer and uh, which is proportional to the difference of k left minus k right, and it would be impossible to gauge. So instead of writing this equation, you can just keep it for the advanced students. A more invariant statement is that if k left is not equal to k right, then the current conservation cannot be upheld at coincident points, and that means that it cannot be gauged. The symmetry cannot be gauged. It's a good global symmetry. There is nothing wrong with it. At separated points, it's still conserved but it cannot be gauged. Okay, so that's how quantum anomalies arise in some models that uh, there, there could be this uh, uh, obstruction to satisfying the current conservation equation at coincident points. I'm just looking for the eraser. Oh. Okay, are there any questions about uh, the rules of, I mean the rules which I'm using to to constrain this correlation function. Okay. Now, yes. Yes, I'll write a bigger, with a bigger font. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> so, let's try to see how would you measure k left and k right? I want to make this point that k left, k left and k right are completely measurable more clear. k is obviously not measurable by separated points correlation functions because it appears only here and it's a pure contact term. But k left and k right are completely physical measurable quantities so you can do some measurements and decide if the theory suffers from a quantum anomaly or it doesn't suffer from a quantum anomaly. If k left is equal to right then you can choose in our previous notation, A equals B equals C. So you can uphold the classical conservation equations, even at coincident points. Yes. Right, so if K left is not equal to K right, then you cannot uh, satisfy the conservation equation at coincident points. And once you couple the theory to a gauge field, that would lead to an actual violation of the conservation of the current and therefore the theory would not be consistent. You would not be able to quantize the theory in a gauge invariant fashion. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can think about it in this language. Uh, what I'm trying to do is to Yeah, this can be viewed as some obstruction, but I'm not, I mean, there are many points of view. I'm just trying to do something very simple because there is some uh, physical point that I want to make. So uh, I'm going, which I'm going to do now. So let's study, 
let's try to understand how you would measure k left and k right. Yes. Well, this was just a comment for the advanced students. Uh, what I, I can explain what, uh, maybe we can discuss it in the discussions. We can discuss it in the discussion sessions. The, how anomalies are related to the obstruction for gauging is something that I can explain uh, in a lot of detail, maybe in the discussion section. Here, I don't want to emphasize it too much. I just want to uh, show something uh, concrete about this K left and K right and how they behave under normalization group flows. But the obstruction to gauging is indeed something we can discuss. It's a, it's a somewhat a delicate story that we can discuss separately. So let's just make a clear, I just want to make the point that K left and K right are measurable completely clear. So let's go to very high energies, meaning very short distances in the language of position space. So this is like very, very short distances. Since this function A goes to zero at short distances or at high energies, uh, this can be dropped. And the correlation functions that somebody who is doing experiments at very short distances, the correlation functions that this person would measure would be J plus J plus is equal to K left P plus squared over P squared. J plus J minus would vanish. And J minus J minus would be K right times p minus squared over p squared. That's what you would measure if you were to do correlation functions at very, very nearby points. <clears throat> now, this in position space, let's, if you do the Fourier transform, that looks like k left uh, <coughs> over x plus squared. This looks like k right over x minus squared. And this is basically 0, OK? So you would see that the that excitations which have a plus and excitations which have a minus are orthogonal at very short distances, while those that have a minus minus and plus plus, they have this kind of correlation functions. So you would, it's something that you can measure. Uh, <clears throat> now, let's discuss what an experimentalist who measures, yes? Uh, K is a constant, so it's a contact term, right? So you could say it's like, it's like K times a delta function. But OK, experimentally, we, we just make separated points measurements. So this is like 0. OK. <clears throat> uh, so now we have this picture in mind that there is a short distance physics and there is a long distance physics. So at short distances, that's what you measure. Then there is some complicated function A that tells you what happens at the crossover scale, which you could also measure. It's interesting. But I want now to make measurements at very, very long distances where you get a new conformal field theory. <clears throat> so we just need to take this function A and send it and, and take the limit where p squared is very small. So let's assume that this function A goes to, to some new constant gamma. Uh, when p squared goes to zero. Okay? So what would you measure? What you would measure is uh, basically this would be some new constant at very long distances. So it's again some contact term. It's not interesting. This, however, would modify the effective k left. And this would modify the effective k right Okay, by gamma. So you would say that k right of the infrared theory is given by k right of the UV theory plus gamma. k left of the infrared theory is k left of the UV theory plus gamma. Right? That's what you would measure if you were to make experiments at very long distances. And that's what you would measure if you were to make experiments uh, at, at very short distances. I don't need the UV subscript because I define them to be such that A vanishes at high energies, so they are the ultraviolet k. So this is, the, this is the formula for what you would measure in the infrared conformal field theory. 
Now there is a magic. You subtract these two equations, and you see that delta k in the infrared is delta k. So under this complicated renormalization group flow, we found a conserved quantity. The difference between k left and k right remains the same under renormalization group flow. <coughs> so we have a conserved quantity under renormalization groups. Okay? This is the first consequence that we can immediately draw from this careful analysis of the two-point functions. This can actually be measured in the experiment, that this is true. Uh, another very interesting consequence that you can uh, derive, which is what I'm going to prove now, is that gamma is smaller than zero, always. So we have a conserved quantity along the RG flow, but we also have an inequality for this parameter that relates the deep UV and the deep infrared. So I'm going to give you an argument. It's, it's a simple consequence of this careful analysis that actually gamma is negative. So let's prove that gamma is negative. <coughs> so I, I am going to, to prove that uh, I'm going to prove a, a certain a, a thing that you, you could call a sum rule. Uh, this I still want to preserve. Yeah, this I will erase. So I'm going to give a formula for gamma, which is manifestly negative, up to some numerical factors that you can fix. It's in the exercise. So gamma is minus the integral over all of space <coughs> of a positive definite function. Now, this looks like a, an, operate, an operator squared. So it's the norm of some operator. And therefore, this is positive. This is positive, and this is positive. So therefore, this is negative. Okay, so I'm going to try to explain why this formula is true. Are there a, any questions about why if this formula is true, then that would follow that gamma is negative. Okay, so let me try to prove this formula. And then I'll try to explain why this formula is true. And I'll, I mean, then I'll try to explain why there is a conserved quantity and why this formula is true, to give you some philosophical explanation for where this uh, results about connecting the ultraviolet and the infrared come from. Uh, so let's first start with the proof. Gamma is an integral over all of space. Just a number. It's a negative, it's a non-positive number. So you see immediately that that already answers the question. I mean, it gives some constraint on which conformal filters could be at the endpoints of renormalization group flows because there are some non-trivial constraints. They have to have the same delta k and it has to be true that uh, each of the k's in the infrared is smaller than the corresponding k in the UV. Okay, so how do we prove this, this kind of formulas? So it, it, it's actually a simple consequence of this, of this uh, business. Uh, let's study P plus J minus P plus J minus. Let's study this correlation function. So we just take this guy, sorry, we take this guy and hit it twice with P plus. So we get P squared times P squared over P squared times A. So we get a P squared times A of P squared over M squared plus P squared times K. Right? This is just in momentum space. Now let me take the second derivative. Let me take the second derivative of that guy uh, with respect to momentum squared. So let's take d squared over dp 
D. So here there is mu, mu of this correlation function. And let's evaluate the second derivative at zero momentum. So therefore it has to act on p squared and p squared. It can't act on the function a because if it did, then setting p to zero would annihilate it eventually. So we have to act on these two p squareds. So at zero momentum, we get gamma plus kappa k right, which is just the definition, which is simply the definition of a k infrared. K infrared r. Are there any questions about this? So this second derivative of the correlation function at zero momentum is k. So now the idea is that you just write this in Fourier space. How do you do a Fourier transform for something at zero momentum? You just integrate over all the possible positions. The second derivative can be translated to x squared, and this is just that. So the integral over all of space gives you the difference between the UV and the infrared. Now I'm slightly, there is a small point that I still need to explain, because it would seem that the answer is just k right of the infrared, while here I claim that the answer for this Fourier transform is gamma. Well, you have to be careful. <coughs> you have to be careful because uh, you, when you do this Fourier transform, you also integrate over the point x where this coincides with that. And this gives you the k of the uv. So, when you, so the correct integral is here to actually, you're instructed to subtract the point zero where there is a delta function. If you were not to subtract this point zero where there was a delta function, then you would just compute k infrared r by definition. But if, if you subtract this point, then you compute k infrared r minus k of the ultraviolet, which is x equals to zero. And this is exactly gamma. So you have to be careful to do this integral over separated points, and then it's true that it's positive, okay? So for this to be positive, it has to be a separated points correlation function. So uh, this is the actual correct formula, that it's an integral over separated points. And it follows from this Fourier transform rather immediately. Are there any questions? Was it a little bit too quick? Should I explain more carefully? Gamma is an integral over all of space, yes. The what? Yes, the origin has some delta function one of these contact terms. So the origin has a delta function that is proportional to kr. So you can write gamma as the difference between k infrared and k uv, and the integral computes k infrared when you include this point, so when you subtract this point, you get gamma. Are there any questions about why this is true? Okay, now I want to, uh, so there are these two, uh, facts about every possible renormalization group flow that gamma has to be negative and delta k has to be conserved. I want to give you a philosophical explanation for why these constraints exist, and then to give a new derivation that is actually much more general and can be applied to many other systems. This kind of derivations, they are very special to two dimensions where I'm using light cone coordinates and I'm using a lot the simplifications of two-dimensional physics, but there is a philosophical reason why this, this, this kind of constraints exist, and these philosophical reasons can be uh, generalized to higher dimensions uh, in applications which are even more interesting than that. So that's what I want to do next. So we've, we've, we've observed two facts. One is that there is some inequality, and one is that there is a conserved quantity. And I want to give an ex explanation for what is the physical origin of, this, of these things. So the first is that we have this inequality, which has the delta k infrared equals to delta k in the ultraviolet. So the question is, where does it come from? Why is it true? So, uh, one, there, there are several ways to understand where does this come from. Uh, one explanation, 
One intuitive explanation is that, you see, if k left and k right are different, then uh, right moving modes and left moving modes are not quite the same. Now, you may have this intuition that when at the crossover scale, you only have massive degrees of freedom. And massive degrees of freedom, by definition, have left moving modes and right moving modes. So if you have a massive fermion in two dimensions or a massive scalar, it has both right moving and left moving modes. So what this equation is telling you, more or less, is that th there might be some imbalance in the degrees of freedom that propagate at the speed of light, because degrees of freedom that propagate in the speed of light can be either right moving or left moving. But at the crossover scale, where you encounter massive degrees of freedom, they move both left and right in some sense in the same, you know, in the, to the same extent. And therefore, the difference between modes that are moving purely to the left or purely to the right is conserved. Because at the crossover scale, you, only, you have only, only modes that move both left and right. This is a very vague physical explanation for what this equation means. Uh, <clears throat> now, more technically, it can be understood according to a Tuft. Uh, so, a Tuft gave, Tuft gave a general uh, way uh, to understand where these conserved quantities come from. So, the first observation that Tuft makes is that if k left is equal to k right in the ultraviolet, then we can get then the sim, then the co current is conserved also at coincident points, and therefore it has to be conserved at coincident points also in the infrared. A more general way to say it is that if the current is conserved at coincident points, we can gauge the corresponding symmetry. We can gauge the we can couple this current to a gauge field and gauge it. And since we've done that in the defining you know since we've done that at short distances, nothing can go wrong at long distances because the long distance physics emerges from the short distance physics. So that's a general argument that Hooft gave, and you can quantify it by saying that even, even if you couldn't, you couldn't gauge the symmetry, the amount by which you failed should be conserved along the renormalization group evolution. So this is an argument due to a Hooft uh, that uh, basically says that if it's conserved at coincident points, it still has to be conserved at coincident points, even in the deep infrared. Um, so, the other, the other part is why do we have this inequality? What is the philosophical origin for this inequality? And I would like to propose a, an explanation for what's the physical origin of this inequality. So, I'm going to try to explain that this additional inequality exists because there is an enhanced symmetry. Okay, there is an enhanced symmetry in the UV and in, and in the infrared. Okay. So I'll make now a, a long argument explaining why these inequalities are deeply connected to some enhanced symmetries that appear here and here. And if you understand this argument, you would be able to understand why this kind of inequalities exist in many, many other situations, I believe. It's always due to this enhanced, enhanced symmetry. <coughs> So let me try to make the argument. But before that, are there any questions about the conserved quantities? That uh, the arguments for them are due to Tuft, who said that if it's conserved at coincident points in the defining theory, it has to be conserved at coincident points also in the emergent theory at long distances. This is the essence of Tuft's argument. Are there any questions about it? Or... Okay, so I assume you all know this argument. Uh, now I'll try to explain why this inequality is deeply associated to enhanced symmetry. So for that, for that, I would like to consider these equations again. So these equations, you remember where they came from. They came from imposing this conservation equation. And this was the most general solution to the conservation equations. Now, what I would like to claim is that if you are an experimentalist who only observes the deep UV or the deep infrared, for example, you compute correlation functions at very long distances or very, very short distances, you don't have access to the crossover scale, you would actually find that there is another conserved symmetry. So, let me write it down. At the deep UV or deep infrared, there is another conserved symmetry. 
there is another conservation law. What is, the, what is the conservation law? It's the statement that not only d mu j mu vanishes, but also d mu epsilon mu nu j nu vanishes. So as an operator equation, again, this is an operator equation. So as always, this means up to coincident points. So I claim that there is another conservation law at short and long distances. And I will try to explain why this entails an inequality. Uh, why this entails this inequality. So let's see how to prove that this is true. So let's go again to very short distances or very long distances. At very short or very long distances, so at short or long distances, recall that the correlation functions simplify dramatically. We have j plus j plus equals p plus squared over p squared times k left. j plus j min minus vanishes. And j minus j minus is p minus squared over p squared times k right. Okay, these were the correlation functions that an observer at very long or very short distances would see. So if you are at short distances, you use the case of the UV. If you are at long distances, you use the case of the infrared. Now, these equations are consistent with two conservation laws. One for the original current and the other for the dual current. Because essentially, the, what this equation means in uh, light cone coordinates, so p plus j minus plus p minus j plus is our original conservation law that we started from. And then there is the conservation law that is emergent only at very short and very long distances. It's an approximate conservation law which reads p plus j minus minus p minus j plus vanishes. So there is a crucial minus sign here. You see that if this is obeyed, then this is obeyed trivially at very short and very long distances. Because if you flip the sign of j minus, this set of correlation functions transforms to itself. So if you just flip the sign of j minus, which is what you are instructed, sorry, if you just flip the sign of j plus, which is what you are instructed to do here, this remains invariant. But if you are at the crossover scale, at the crossover scale, this correlation function does not vanish, the mixed components. And therefore, flipping the sign would lead to disastrous consequences. So this symmetry is not conserved at, separ at, at the crossover scale. It's an emergent symmetry that appears at very short distances and very long distances, very much like the conformal symmetry itself. Okay, So it's very much like the conformal symmetry. It's an emergent symmetry. So it's a symmetry of the short distance physics that is violated explicitly uh, at long distances. So, and so this is violated by this function A of p squared at the crossover scale. So it's not a good symmetry in general, it's just emergent. Okay, uh, now, I will try to, to show that from the fact that this emergent symmetry exists, you can derive in a rather direct way this inequality, just from this fact. And then you could repeat the same logic in many other examples. So this is beyond Hooft. Hooft just defined these conserved quantities. But the claim here is that if there are enhanced symmetries at the fixed points, then you could derive inequalities. And so you, would, you could put interesting constraints on the renormalization group flows. So let's do that. I would like to use that fact to, to prove an inequality. So I would do it in a lot of detail. It's a very interesting exercise, I think, uh, which has a lot of interesting physics. To go from, yeah, so it has a lot of interesting ingredients to go from that observation to the inequality, but it's very, very general because one can follow the same footsteps in many other examples. 
OK, so how do we start? So we, we may consider, let's do two in two steps. The first step, I use, I'll use just letting. OK, the first step that we will do uh, is to uh, couple this current j plus and j minus to a gauge field. So we are going to deform the action by a plus j minus plus a minus j plus. Okay. So this is an external gauge field. It's not a dynamical gauge field. It's the one uh, that uh, Marco <coughs> asked about. So this is an external gauge field, which I'm adding to the theory. It's just a source that I can use to study various correlation functions of j. Now this, this com now comes the part that I promised to explain. So now the partition we can define the partition function of the theory, which is a logarithm of. So let's define the logarithm of the partition function. Now this is going to be some function of the gauge field, a plus and a minus, and this is defined to be just the logarithm of the pass integral of minus the action over all the quantum fields, plus this deformation term. So we have some partition function that we have defined as a function of these sources. This is defined throughout the RG flow. It's some object that's completely well defined throughout the RG flow. I'm not specifying that it's defined only in the UV or only in the infrared. It's everywhere defined. Now, this partition function has some gauge symmetries. So it doesn't depend on A plus and A minus in a completely general way. If you make a gauge transformation, then it might go to itself. So for the sake of simplicity, I'm now going to make a small assumption. Uh, you can generalize this assumption. It's not going to be crucial. I'm going to make an assumption that k left and k right and k are all the same. So I'm going to discuss only a subclass of models. But this is enough because I'm interested in this inequality. And the inequality would still say something about the infrared uh, k's compared to the ultraviolet case. So I'm going to make this assumption and then prove that the infrared case are smaller than the ultraviolet case. But I'm making this assumption just for simplicity. So now, uh, inspired by this fact that there, is, that there are two conserved currents in the deep UV and the deep infrared, we're going to define two possible gauge transformations. A plus going to A plus plus D plus omega plus d plus nu. Omega and nu are some functions. And the a minus going to a minus plus d minus omega minus d minus nu. So I define two gauge parameters. One is the standard one that you know from the books. And the other one has a funny sign compared to the other one. So this has the funny sign. One of them corresponds to this conserved symmetry, to the original conserved symmetry, and the other one corresponds to the enhanced symmetry that only exists at the fixed points. So we're going to analyze how does the partition function behave under these two gauge transformations. So the first claim is that under the omega gauge transformation, the partition function is perfectly invariant. This is the, an exact claim. Uh, why is that true? First, because I impose this equation that k left is equal to k right, and therefore there are no gauge anomalies. So the current, the original current, can be conserved at coincident and at separated points, so it's perfectly fine. These gauge transformations are perfectly fine. They act like you would expect. There are no quantum anomalies. Now, under the new gauge, under the knee gauge transformations, the partition function would not be in general invariant. There are two reasons why it's not in general invariant. One is that this symmetry is just an accidental symmetry or an enhanced symmetry at the UV and infrared fixed points. 
So it's not an actual symmetry of the partition function, so there is no reason why that should vanish. And the other reason that it doesn't vanish is that, in fact, even <coughs> at the original fix, even at the deep UV and in the deep infrared, this emergent symmetry is upheld at separated points, but at coincident points, there is a contact term. I would exp I, I'm, not, I'm going to explain this contact term now, but let me just write the equation, and then we'll explain the contact term. So the equation that you get for this uh, gauge transformation is going to look like d2x nu epsilon mu nu f mu nu, where f mu nu, or we can just write f plus minus for the sake of concreteness. And the coefficient is going to be k, which is the same k. Plus many, many other terms that come from the fact that the crossover scale, the physics is not invariant under this symmetry. So it's just an enhanced symmetry. This is an object that would exist even at the fixed points. And these terms come from the fact that this is not a good symmetry along the renormalization group flow. Now, f plus minus is defined to be just d plus a minus minus d minus a plus. So it's the usual field strength that you know. So what I would like to do is to explain this term, which is there even at the UV and infrared fixed points, where the symmetry is indeed an enhanced symmetry. So this is the usual tooth-like anomaly. Uh, Are there any questions about uh, the logic? Okay, so this is the usual Tooft-like anomaly, and uh, I'm, going, I'm going to explain where this term comes from now in detail. So we're going back to our favorite correlation functions, and I'm going to write them just at the fixed point. It could be either it could be either the ultraviolet or infrared fixed point, but let's, for concreteness, write these correlation functions again at the UV fixed point. So J plus with J plus is a P plus squared over P squared times K. There is only one K now, so I'll reserve the symbol K for all the three of them. J plus P, J minus P is just K. So it's a pure contact term. And J minus P, J minus P is P minus squared over P squared K. So this is the calculation that we already did many times. These are our correlation functions. And now you observe. Now you make an observation. The observation is that P plus J minus plus P minus J plus with, I, with J plus or minus, doesn't matter. This is at P, this is at minus P, this vanishes. This is the statement that we have chosen K left equals K right equals K, and therefore we can respect the conservation equation even at coincident points. This is the first observation. The second observation is that for the enhanced symmetry, this is not true. For the enhanced symmetry, we get P plus J minus, minus P minus J plus, with J plus minus, minus P. Is this visible to everybody or it's too low? Can you see it from upstairs? Okay, good. So this is actually not vanishing. You just look at this equation, you do some algebra, and you will find that this is equal to P plus minus times K. Up to some coefficients that I'm not careful about. Good, so what does, it, what does it mean? It means that even though it is physically true that at short distances and at long distances there is a new enhanced symmetry, a new conserved, approximate conserved charge, 
This charge has some contact terms which don't vanish necessarily. They are proportional to k. This means, this means, this means in, uh, you know, in the technical ter in technical terms that this cons approximate enhanced and symmetry has a Tooft anomaly. Has a Tooft anomaly. So it's a good conserved symmetry, but it has an anomaly. It's not an anomaly that renders the current ill defined or not conserved. It's just, a, an, it's just something that means that if we were to couple the currents J plus and J minus to gauge fields, then, the, then this current, the enhanced current, would no longer be conserved. So this implies this equation that I can explain in the discussion to, uh, that D mu J enhanced, so this is the enhanced symmetry, it's not the original current, this is equal to F rho sigma times epsilon rho sigma, where F is a background gauge field. So this is a background gauge field that we couple to the system. And there is a coefficient k. However, d mu j mu for the original current is identically zero because there are no contact terms. It's non anomalous. So the enhanced symmetry is there. It's nice and good. There is a new conserved current and short and long distances, but it's actually anomalous, necessarily anomalous. Uh, it has a Tooft anomaly with this coefficient k. What it means is that when we couple it to background gauge fields, then there is this uh, cons equation that violates it. So this is why when we perform a gauge transformation of the partition function under new, under these gauge transformations that are parameterized by the function new, then we get this term even at the fixed points where this is a good enhanced symmetry. And then there are lots of other terms that come from the fact that we also violate the symmetry explicitly by this function A that I've already erased. So it's an enhanced symmetry that appears at short and long distances, but across the crovers, in the crossover scale, it's completely violated. So there are lots of other terms. Okay, how much more time do I have? Good. Okay, so let's discuss this equation in the discussion se session. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I was planning to give it as is and proceed to explain how we go from this idea to this monotonicity equations, to this monotonicity relations. So now we draw this picture again that we have some k u v and some k infrared. And our partition function has lots of terms. In the, in, if we do a new gauge transformation, we get lots of terms. It's very complicated. But there is a huge simplification due to the fact that we know that these terms must go away at short distances. Okay? This is a, an input that is very, very crucial to bear in mind the partition function is well defined everywhere along the energy flow. It can be defined at short distances and then the rest follows because long distances emerge from short distances. So at very short distances, we know that the partition function satisfies this equation, plus minus d2x, with the coefficient being k. This is at short distances. And now comes a very non-trivial idea, which is known under the name of anomaly matching. So we know that the partition function in general would have lots of other terms. But when we go to short distances, they disappear. Because at short distances, it's a good conserved symmetry. This is true everywhere, not just at short distances. And this is true only at short distances. But now comes the idea that, you know, once you define the physics at short distances, it should somehow define everything else as well. 
it should define the whole, the whole, uh, it should define the whole physics at all the length scales. And so all these other terms that you have to add should emerge from renormalization group transformations. And they go to zero when you go to short distances or to long distances in some sense. So the idea is that the partition function can also be studied at long distances. And it should satisfy uh, the same rule, because this rule is sort of God-given at short distances. And then at every, single, at every energy scale, this should be reproduced in some way uh, by the dynamics of the theory. Because once you specify some property of the partition function at short distances, the rest should organize itself. You can write this equation schematically that there are some m squared over p squared plus da 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 da. So at very, very short distances, when p goes to infinity, these terms die away. And so the dynamics should somehow organize itself that this transformation rule would be true at every energy scale. How do we make it precise? How do we make this idea that somehow uh, the transformation rules for the partition function should be the same at every energy scale? Because by definition, block spin transformations or renormalization group transformations, they should not change the partition function. They should reproduce the same equations. So we need to make this idea mathematically precise, and that's the next challenge. So the idea is that somehow this equation that d nu log z is equal to k a nu a f plus minus d to x, somehow this equation uh, should be plus terms that are of order 1 over p squared, where p is the momentum should be respected everywhere. Okay. Uh, so the point is that these terms are very small at short distances by definition because we have a good enhanced symmetry. But we, when we go to, to long distances, when we want to understand the physics of these energy scales, these terms become pretty large because they're of order 1 over p squared and you will have to resum them and it would seem to be a very, very complicated process. But we know what the answer should be. In the deep infrared, this symmetry is again conserved, right? So d nu log z uh, should be k infrared times nu f plus minus d to x. But now there are terms of order p squared. So these two equations are mathematically correct. We know that the partition function has some complicated transformation rules, and it's the same partition function. Here, we can approximate it by this term plus terms that go away at short distances. And here, we can, understand, we can approximate it by this term plus terms that go to zero at long distances. And these k's are not the same. These k's are not the same, and what we're interested in is exactly the difference between this and this. We claim that this difference is positive, and it has to do with the physics of these terms that we've thrown away. And we want to understand how they interpolate between this and this. So that's the challenge. So the idea is that we need somehow to find the mechanism to control these corrections. If we can find the mechanism to control these corrections, we might be able to understand why the difference has decreased. And of course, I've already given you a proof that this gamma is negative. But uh, a proof from this point of view is much more useful because it's easily generalizable to many other situations while the previous proof is very unique. It cannot be generalized to other situations. So we need to find a way to control this, uh, this order p squared or order 1 over p squared terms. And this and now comes the main idea that we're going to add another, another background field, which I'm going to call the pion for historical reasons. I'm going to add another background field that is called the pion. So now the partition function is going to be a function of A plus 
A minus, but also another field, pi of x. And I have to tell you how am I adding pi of x to the system? How am I throwing pi x into the mix? So A plus and A minus couple in the way that we have explained. But what do I do with pi of x? So first of all, I'm going to take pi to be invariant under, under omega gauge transformations. And under new gauge transformations, pi is going to transform linearly. So like maybe you've seen in QCD, the pions transform under axial gauge transformations in some inhomogeneous fashion. So uh, I'm going to add this background field. It's not a propagating degree of freedom. It's just another function of, on which the partition function depends. I'm going to add it to the action with some, I'm going to add it into the mix with this specific transformation rule. And the best way to explain how this is added to the action is by an example. So I've been doing a lot of, uh, I've been doing a lot of formal stuff, but now let's do an example, which is a free fermion. I want to do the example of a free fermion in, uh, in two dimensions and show you how this U1 symmetry merges, how there is an enhanced symmetry, and how do I define pi. And from this example, you could understand how it's defined more generally, and then the discussion that will follow will be more clear. So the example of a free fermion, uh, the Lagrangian free fermion with a mass. So the Lagrangian is uh, psi plus d minus minus psi plus plus psi minus d plus plus psi minus plus a mass term. So this is just a free massive fermion complex. Let, let's take it to be complex plus a complex conjugate. Okay, so this would be a single complex fermion with right moving degrees of freedom and left moving degrees of freedom, and there is a mass term. You see that the mass term couples right moving modes to left moving modes. If you don't have mass, then right moving modes and left moving modes are independent, and that's uh, what I said before, that you could have imbalance of uh, massless degrees of freedom. Now, my U1 symmetry is going to act like psi plus and psi minus, going to e to the i alpha psi plus and psi minus. This is a good U1 symmetry that, that is conserved by all the terms in the Lagrangian because this is, and this is also invariant. Okay? This symmetry is the one that has this kappa left, kappa right, and in some conventions in this example, there will be kappa left equals kappa right equals one. Okay? So the, in this theory, it's parity even. So there is a one left moving mode, one right moving mode. So kappa left, k left and k right are the same. And then we have this U1 axial symmetry, which is not exact, but it becomes conserved at short distances. So how does it act? It acts by taking psi plus and psi minus two, e to the i alpha for psi plus, and e to the minus i alpha for psi minus. Okay, so you see that if you throw away the mass term, it's a good symmetry. So at short distances, it becomes a good symmetry. But once you include the mass term, the mass is not invariant under this symmetry. It has charge minus, it has charge two under this new symmetry. Let's call this parameter beta, not to confuse with alpha. Okay, so you see that once we add a mass, this symmetry is broken, but if the theory is massless, then this theory is preserved. These two symmetries are related exactly like what I explained, that this is generated by some current J plus, uh, J mu, and this is generated by the current epsilon mu nu, J nu. So this is the approximate symmetry that I was speaking about. Now, the current of this axial symmetry is not conserved. If you gauge this U1 and you're studying QED, then the, this current would not be conserved. It would be given by, K, by F, by star F, where F is the gauge field. So this is the anomaly equation that I wrote. This is in the massless case. If there is a mass, then this current is not conserved even before you gauge the symmetry. Good. So. Uh, 
what I wanted to say now is that there is the following trick. So we want to understand this enhanced symmetry a little bit better. Uh, so we see that it's conserved at short distances, and it's violated by the mass term. So when you go to the crossover scale, it's completely violated. But the trick is that let's couple this Lagrangian to some, to some background field. So I'm going to put here e to the 2i pi. Okay, so I'm going to add in front of the mass some function. This is like making the mass into a space-time dependent mass. If you don't like to add this additional parameter, you just imagine that you, instead of studying a fermion with constant mass, you study a fermion with a space-time dependent mass. And then formally, if we make this transformation and we accompany this transformation by a shift of the pion, then we get back the same Lagrangian. Of course, it doesn't mean that we have, that we have the symmetry because I'm changing some coupling constant, right? So there are some coupling constants which break the symmetry, but what I'm doing is to assign to these coupling constants some transformation rules that would, as if, restore the symmetry. This is what sometimes is called spurial analysis, that you think about coupling constants that break the symmetries as functions, and then you assign these functions some transformation rules, and then you can restore the symmetry. The simplest example of that is if you do quantum mechanics of a particle moving in an electric field. So let's just think about quantum mechanics, where the Hamiltonian is like something of that sort, some particle moving in some electric field. Then the electric field breaks rotational invariance, but it's still useful to think about rotational invariance that acts on x and on the coupling constant E. Because then the energy levels of the systems of the system are just function of E dot E, right? So the energy levels are, are still just functions of the scalar product of E with itself. So there are SO3 or SOD invariant, even though there, this coupling constant breaks SOD. So assigning coupling constants some transformation rules in this way is a very useful idea to keep track uh, of the symmetry, of how the symmetry is violated. So that's, uh, are there any questions? I, I, I didn't hear the question, but what I'm trying to do is to make all the math, so the, this enhanced symmetry is violated by two sources. One of them is just this anomaly that uh, I explained there. So one of, this, one of the sources is just this anomaly, which exists at a fixed point and you can't do anything about it. The other source which violates this enhanced symmetry is the crossover scale physics like these mass terms. And those you can get rid of or a book keep off by adding this additional background field that transforms under axial symmetry and it helps, it, it helps to just keep track of the symmetry violation. So from this comes the main claim which we will analyze in the next lecture. So what's the main claim? The main claim is that if you do that, then the transformation property of the partition function, which is now some function of a plus a minus n pi, this is now given by k f plus minus d2x, and this is now true exactly, where by definition, delta nu of pi is nu. So this is the main claim, that by doing this trick, the partition function, which now depends on the background gauge fields and this pion, background pion field, now just has the anomaly. All this explicit breaking term due to the crossover physics have been bookkeeped by this additional field pi that transforms. Exactly. Right, so this is an excellent comment. So how do you couple pi to the Lagrangian so that this would be true? You take your Lagrangian, there's like a bunch of mass terms, and each mass term you just multiply with some power of e to the i pi, so that when you do a transformation, axial transformation, it's soaked away. It's soaked up by this pi. Now you could say that this is model dependent, but you can actually give a model independent description. You can 
uh, you can say that pi couples to the divergence of the axial current. The axial current has an anomaly and it has some violation due to these mass terms. So you just couple pi to the uh, divergence of the axial current in flat space. So this is the general description. But this trick allows you to get rid of all these terms that violate this enhanced symmetry. And now you have a good, now it is as if you have a good symmetry along the flow. And the next step is now that we have an exact equation, we can try to compare it with the approximate equations. So this equation is true approximately at high energies, and this equation is true approximately at, in, at low energies. So we have to understand how this exact equation uh, is related to this approximate equation, and this is how this constraint on gamma will emerge. I have five more minutes, right, or not? Okay, should I take five more minutes? Okay, so this is just to bring, to finish this point. So this is now an exact equation, and we have a paradox now. So now we have a paradox. Because we have an exact equation, and it seems to not agree with this approximate equation. So our exact equation agrees with this relation, because at very high energies, this is what we get. But at very low energies, we should get k infrared. Well, our exact equation has k of the UV. So now there is a paradox, because the approximate equation which becomes exact at low energies, doesn't agree with this exact equation. And the resolution, of course, is that we added another background field. So the fact that we added pi of x explains why delta ni of log z which just depend on, on A plus and A minus, had a K infrared in front. F plus minus D to X. So this explains why this is true before we added the pi field. The point is that the log of Z of A plus, A minus, and pi becomes in the infrared uh, some term, some part, it be, in the infrared it can be decomposed in the, into two terms, one of which is just the partition function of the infrared CFT. This is the partition function of the infrared CFT. So this is the partition function of the infrared CFT whose variation under new gives exactly that. But then you need another term, because the, ex the exact uh, transformation rule for the partition function, where was that? Uh, yes, the exact transformation rule for the partition function is that. So uh, you have to add another term, which would make up for the difference. So it has to be proportional to k minus k. And this is exactly what we were looking for, right? Some constraint on this guy. And so we have to write some action here. We have to add some term which would soak up the difference correctly. So let me just write it abstractly. We have to add KUV minus KIR times some action, some local action that depends on the pion and A plus and A minus, such that its variation, such that delta nu of s local is exactly nu times f plus minus. Okay, so if we could achieve that, then there would be no paradoxes. Because when you, we turn off the pi on, this will go away, this will remain, and this would correspond to this approximate transformation rule that we found there. But with the pi on, the full, the, the full transformation rule would be what it should be, that this is the exact result. So the only remaining part is to determine this action, this local action which soaks up the difference. You can think about this term as coming from this massive degrees of freedom that violated the axial symmetry along the RG flow. And so they generated some local effective action for this background field so that they would soak up the difference in the anomaly.
So the way to determine this local action is uh, simply from this transformation rule. This transformation rule fixes it uniquely. So your first guess would be to write pi times f plus minus d2x, right? This is the first guess. Why this is a good guess? Because remember that d nu pi is nu. So if we do a d nu of this equation, we get nu times f plus minus, which is more or less what we need. But this cannot be the full answer. Because uh, remember that under gauge transformations, d nu a nu of a plus is d plus nu, and d nu of a minus is minus d minus nu. Therefore, f plus minus is not invariant under new transformations because of this funny minus sign. d nu of f plus minus is just box of nu. So this is not a good answer. We have to fix it a little bit. We fix it by adding another term, pi of x, box of pi of x. And now you can check that all the mixed terms cancel out and this local action exactly reproduces this transformation rule. So now everything makes sense. Now we have uh, some theory where there is an approximate symmetry. It's violated, but we have managed to understand the extent to which the symmetry is violated by some local effective action that depends on a new background field pi. And now it's more or less straightforward to derive that this difference is positive. Why? Because let's now take a plus equals a minus equals zero. This is the original flat space Minkowskian theory that we're interested in after all. So then this goes away and we have something that looks like a kinetic term. So in the action we have KUV minus K infrared multiplying a kinetic term. Something that looks like a kinetic term but it's for a background field. So the point is that the kinetic terms for background fields and the kinetic terms for dynamical fields, obviously, they have to be positive definite because they correspond to some correlation functions at separated points. And so this has to be positive. Otherwise, you violate unitarity. Yeah, I can explain more rigorously why you have to demand that kinetic terms for background fields are positive, but they have to be positive because they correspond to some separate point correlation functions. But loosely speaking, it looks like a kinetic term, so it has to be positive. And this is how it follows. So, the, so I just, no more equations, just to recapitulate, recapitulate the idea. I think it's a non-trivial, not, not completely trivial story, so the, the general idea is the following. It works in many, many other cases, but I've just explained this case here. You have some complicated RG flow. Some quantities are conserved. The quantities that are conserved were more or less classified by a tooth. They correspond to some uh, conservation equations that hold at separated points versus coincident points. But then some quantities decrease. And the cases in which we can control this uh, decrease uh, is when there is an extended symmetry. When there is an extended symmetry, we can uh, try to account for the violation of this extended symmetry due to the crossover scale by adding new background fields and then finding a local effective action for these new background fields. And in many cases, it turns out that they have to be with positive coefficients. So the general physical picture, I think, is that if there is some symmetry along the RG flow, you have conserved quantities due to a tooth. But even if you just have extended enhanced symmetries at the fixed points, you can still do something which is very similar to what the Tooth did, but you get constraints which are inequalities rather than equalities. So that's, I think, the general picture, and it works for many examples that I will list. I will make a list in the next session of all the cases where this logic can be repeated, and it gives new results. And then we'll discuss a new topic. Okay, thanks.